thank you. It's nice to be here. I appreciate seeing all of you, even some former students. It is, uh, the topic today is birthright citizenship in the U.S. Constitution. And uh, the, the term birthright citizenship, as, as many of you will know, it refers here, it's used in the U.S., it's referred to the automatic grant of citizenship to any person born within the territorial United States. Uh, and this is the, this is an image that I thought I would uh, have ready for you. There are two traditions or legal practices of, of long standing on how nations assign citizenship. And these are known by the Roman terms jus soli and jus sanguinis. Uh, both were known to the Roman law, but the jus soli, which we'll talk about today, jus soli in the Middle Ages became uh, a distinctively common law doctrine developed in England. The notion was if you were born within the king's territory, you owed allegiance to that king, and in return, the king owed you protection. Uh, so it was territorial birthright citizenship, the law of the soil, used solely, uh, that really became a common law tradition and is the origin of the practice in the United States. So England, the American colonies, Australia, New Zealand, all of those in the common law tradition follow the use solely. The use sanguinis, uh, law of the blood, was again from Roman law, a practice in Roman law and also a practice in um, the rest of Europe uh, other than England. And this is a, according citizenship, according to the status of your parents. So your, your citizenship at birth is the citizenship of your parents, regardless of the territory where you are born. So in terms of international law, international legal practices, these are the two traditions. And just, um, I wanted to show you a, a map that shows you today in the modern sort of practices of nations, which nations follow which rules. Um, the orange and the red here are um, used solely, territorial birthright citizenship. So you can see it's most of Latin America, the United States and Canada. Uh, what is the rest of the world doing? Use sanguinis, citizenship. It's usually a combination of both being born in the territory, but also uh, the use sanguinis, the um, citizenship descending from the parents. So it's interesting to me just to think about this map. The orange countries have a civil law tradition, um, and then the common law tradition uh, to the north with the United States and Canada. Now with respect to the common law tradition, again, sort of the use solely this notion, um, historical notion of birth within a territory is what gives you the status, uh, the nationality of that, of that uh, territory. That is uh, originated with England, but England itself has now changed its practice. So you'll notice that Great Britain is not um, represented here as a use solely country, it is no longer. Um, and also Australia, New Zealand, and the other common law tradition countries that followed the use solely where birth alone was sufficient to accord citizenship have also changed their rules in ways that, uh, as has been suggested in the United States, in ways that do not automatically grant citizenship for children of undocumented aliens. And those changes have really just happened in the last 20 years. The United Kingdom changed its rule in 1983. Uh, Australia much more recently. Now that's, so that's the division today. It's also interesting to look at it in the perspective of new world versus old world. Some explanations for why you see um, sort of Latin America along with the United States and Canada uh, having a more open, if you will, uh, citizenship practice had to do with encouraging immigration, had to do with peopling these countries and, and so forth. But that's the, that's the situation in the world. What I want to talk about though today is the current debate in the United States. And what fuels the debate, of course, is, um, is angst over illegal immigration. Now the, uh, the so-called anchor baby phenomenon, the, the promise of citizenship for children, the, the, the argument that that is in fact a draw for illegal immigration, which uh, I would suggest is largely a myth, but it is not an insignificant issue. The Pew Center recently issued um, 
a study that estimated that around 7% of all births in the United States in 2008, this again is an estimate, but 7% of all births in the United States in 2008, which is about 340,000, were the offspring of unauthorized immigrants and became United States citizens. So it's not an insignificant issue. There's an estimate of about, and again, the facts and figures are hard to come by when we're discussing unauthorized um, aliens, but there's an estimate that there are about five million children living in the United States uh, who have unauthorized immigrant parents, about five million children. And of those five million children, 80% were born here. So 80% of those five, four million children are U.S. citizens. Their parents are not U.S. citizens, but there's still a significant number of children, of minors, uh, living here whose parents are undocumented, but they were born elsewhere. Uh, so it, going back to this notion that um, the anchor baby phenomenon, which is, um, in terms of proponents of changing the rule of birthright citizenship in the United States, will sometimes say, uh, it is a draw for illegal behavior. It is a draw for uh, illegal immigrants because uh, they know that by having children here, the children become citizens and they are the so-called anchor for the family. The, the myth part of that is uh, that the U.S. can and does deport parents of citizen children. The parents are here. Um, as an undocumented status, even though they have uh, minor citizen children, they can be and are deported. Uh, uh, nearly 25,000 per year fall into this situation. Um, often the minor children go with them. If there are no other care arrangements, um, uh, they do have a right of return, of course, as U.S. citizens. At the age of 21, those citizen children can petition to have their parents join them in the United States. Um, but it is not an automatic right. And if there are uh, law violations in the history for those, for those parents, and this would include immigration violations, that petition can be and has been denied. So in terms of the um, looking at the, uh, at the sort of political uh, pull behind that as an anchor, the so-called anchor baby phenomenon, uh, that part of it seems to be largely a myth. Now, of these children uh, who are born in the United States, and again, these are not insignificant numbers, if the uh, estimates are correct that there have been four million currently living who were born in the United States, uh, but under proposals to change the rule would not have been entitled to citizenship, most of those were not uh, born to recent arrivals. These are persons who've been living in the United States for a long time, and their parents uh, have been. So, so again, it's not the, if the image is uh, pregnant women waiting at the border uh, to you know, find a way to come across just to have the children, that's really not borne out by the, uh, by the numbers, at least that are reflected by uh, the persons who fall into this citizenship category. But, um, but my purpose here really is to um, address not whether uh, it should be changed, the, the rule of birthright citizenship in the United States, but how uh, it could be changed if there is the political will to do so. I want to show you just in terms of the background, here are just a series of um, uh, editorial arguments, this one addressing the, the so-called uh, editorial cartoons, this one addressing the so-called anchor baby uh, phenomenon. But in terms of um, if the rule were to change, how is it to be done? And here's the modern debate, and this is what I want us to, to focus on today. The essential question is, uh, in order to change the, the practice of birthright citizenship for these children that I, we've been talking about, territorial birthright citizenship, um, the essential question is whether you have to amend the U.S. Constitution or can Congress do it by statute? And that's the debate that I want to talk about today. So let's start with the language of the, uh, of the 14th Amendment. Here it is. Um, All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. 
Um, the argument that Congress can change this by statute centers on the words that I've put in italics there and subject to the jurisdiction thereof. There are uh, pending bills in Congress, one of which uh, I have reproduced in the materials that you have. Um, there are pending bills in Congress to accomplish this, to deny uh, automatic territorial birthright citizenship for the children of undocumented aliens. Uh, my own, and I want to, so I want to look closely at this question. Are those statutes, or statute like that, is that constitutional? Or do you have to amend the Constitution? Uh, my own view is that it's not really a very close question, but I want to lay it out here for you. I think, I think you, uh, it requires a constitutional amendment, but I want to set out the argument for you so you can uh, judge that for yourself. Now, the argument that Congress can change this practice by statute and not by amending the 14th Amendment is relatively new. Uh, the, the Republican Party in the 1990s included in its platform a call for a constitutional amendment to change the rule of birthright citizenship in the 14th Amendment. So in the 90s, you would see, as a part of the platform, um, of, of a, the party's platform, a call for a constitutional amendment. That constitutional amendment went away from the platform. And in recent years, now you see arguments that, in fact, you don't need to amend the Constitution. Congress has this power and presumably had the power <laughs> all along. So it's really only been in the past few years that, um, that the argument for congressional authority has been raised, and I think you can understand why. The constitutional amendment process in the United States is very difficult. For us here, I think it's safe to say for all of us here in our lifetimes, we have not seen a constitutional amendment, a successful one. Very difficult to do, two-thirds majority for both houses of Congress. Uh, and if you can get those kinds of supermajorities in both houses to propose an amendment, then you need ratification by three-fourths of the states. So you can understand the attraction. Uh, for, if there are proponents who would like to change the rule, you can understand the attraction of, of convincing people that you can do it by statute and not by amending the, the Constitution. So that's the, that's the argument that I want to have us look at today. Now, um, most legal, legal scholars conclude that um, Congress has, does not have this authority. I mean, not all of them, but, but most do. And it, 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 all of you who you know, have been to law school know that law professors don't really agree on anything. Uh, so it shouldn't be surprising that there are, there are contrasting views out there. Um, but most, most scholars agree that um, there is no such authority in Congress either on originalist grounds, in other words, uh, the original understanding of the 14th Amendment, which we're going to talk about a little bit today, either on that or because of the plain language of the statute. So, you know, sort of two uh, competing ways, interpretive tools uh, that modern Supreme Courts use with respect to both statutes and the Constitution. Now, um, so any person, regardless of their parents, regardless of the status of their parents, acquires citizenship at birth so long as he or she is subject to the jurisdiction of the United States. Um, proponents of congressional authority reason as follows. They say, uh, because the parents are in the country illegally, they are not subject to the jurisdiction of the United States. So the debate is really all about this phrase. Um, so to address these uh, arguments, I want to do a, a relatively brief historical review. I happen to think it's very interesting material. It may be new to some of you, uh, but we'll do it briefly. There is a more extended discussion of some of this historical background also in your materials. I've provided a congressional report on this topic from a few years ago uh, that you would be welcome to refer to uh, later on. All right, so the 14th Amendment, notice I say ratified 1868. It's a post-Civil War, post post-U.S. Civil War Amendment. It, is, it was enacted together with the 13th Amendment, which ends slavery, and the 15th Amendment, which provided uh, African-American males with the right to vote. Um, and it, so they are, those three are together known as the Reconstruction Amendments, the end of the Civil War, putting the country back together. The original Constitution 
did not define citizenship the prior to the 14th Amendment. Here's what it did. The, the original Constitution uses the words citizen of the United States. It, it uses those in the section uh, where it talks about qualifications for members of Congress and Senate. It gives a term of years that you have to have been a citizen of the United States. And then it says that the president has to be a natural born citizen of the United States, but it doesn't define them. So those are the, in terms of the original Constitution, that's what we know about citizenship. But here's what we also know about citizenship in the original Constitution, which is Congress was granted the power of naturalization. The Congress shall have power to establish a uniform rule of naturalization. Congress can make citizens. Congress can make citizens. And again, this is part of the argument that there is statutory authority in Congress to change this rule. They have the power to naturalize uh, and are not limited, is the argument, by the language of the 14th Amendment with respect to uh, territorial birthright citizenship. Now, um, the citizenship clause of the 14th Amendment was designed to address the Dred Scott case. And if you think back to uh, Dred Scott, a decision before the US Civil War, which said uh, in part that uh, persons of African descent could not become United States citizens they could not become United States citizens, that they weren't intended to be part of the polity at the time of the, of the founding, whether they were free or slave, um, made no difference that African Americans could not become citizens of the United States. It uh, was one of many factors that complicated uh, sort of legal status of uh, free persons of color, both before and after the Civil War, but it was uh, most particularly what the Reconstruction Congress wanted to address, wanted to overturn that ruling of Dred Scott. You've got uh, the war is over, you have uh, former slaves that are now free, you have uh, free persons of color who remain free, but the question is how do you give them political or civil rights? So this was first attempted by statute. And this is useful language, I think, for us to take a look at because it's an important part of the historical background of how we ended up with the 14th Amendment. This is the 1866 Civil Rights Act, a statute. The Reconstruction Congress, and I just want to read some of this language to you, um, enacted um, a very broad and encompassing Civil Rights Act, but it begins with this clause. All persons born in the United <coughs> States and not subject to any foreign power excluding Indians not taxed, are hereby declared to be citizens of the United States, and such citizens of every race and color without regard to any previous condition of slavery or involuntary servitude, shall have the same right in every state and territory in the United States to full and equal benefit of all laws and proceedings for the security of person and property as is enjoyed by white citizens. So enacted by the Reconstruction Congress soon after the close of the Civil War, uh, and look what it accomplishes. It, it is, again, it is to declare uh, that the former slaves are in fact citizens, that they have the same right in every state and territory, et cetera. So uh, the, the language is similar to what we'll ultimately have in the 14th Amendment, but this is the first articulation of that effort. Now, uh, what happens next, President Andrew Johnson vetoes that. He vetoes it on the ground that it is unconstitutional, that Congress does not have the authority to make citizens of the African-American descendants um, and the former slaves within states. No authority to do that vetoes it. And here's part of the veto message that I want to uh, read to you briefly. By the first section of the bill, all persons born in the United States and not subject to any foreign power, excluding Indians not taxed, are declared, I'm sorry, yeah, are declared to be citizens of the United States. This provision comprehends the Chinese of the Pacific states, Indians subject to taxation, the people called gypsies, as well as the entire race designated as blacks, persons of color, Negroes, mulattoes, and persons of African blood. Every individual of those races born in the United States is, by the bill, made a citizen of the United States. He goes on in his veto message to uh, explain his view 
that this is unconstitutional, that Congress doesn't have the power. In, in the enumerated powers of Congress, this isn't one of them. Um, now, so, so the question, Congress fairly easily overrode this veto. But there was sufficient doubt about Congress's authority in this area that the decision was made to include it in the Constitution, in the 14th Amendment. And you'll remember the 14th Amendment does a lot of things. When we look at the 14th Amendment, um, it, it includes the Due Process, the Equal Protection Clause, you know, some of the most litigated parts of the Constitution today and so forth. Uh, but the idea is that you put it into the Constitution to allay these doubts about its constitutionality that the President and others had raised at the time. Now, in terms of the debate itself, um, this is just uh, one part that I've pulled out of the uh, congressional debates over the Civil Rights Act. And the de so there's, there are fewer debates on this clause about the 14th Amendment because I think the Congress felt like it had already aired the issue. But here's what they say. Um, uh, here's an exchange between two persons in the Senate. Mr. Cowan, whether it will not have the effect of naturalizing the children of Chinese and gypsies born in this country, Mr. Trumbull undoubtedly is not the child born in this country of German parents a citizen. Mr. Cowan, the children of German parents are citizens, but Germans are not Chinese. Mr. Trumbull, the law makes no such distinction, and the child of an Asiatic is just as much a citizen as the child of a European. Um, now, in terms of going back to the amendment itself, so, so you can see that there was a, a, an alteration in the language. If anything, it's more succinct here than um, more prolix in the uh, 1866 Civil Rights Act. But this is what we end up with uh, for language in the Constitution. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. So this is some background that helps us to understand um, what do we think Congress meant or the, or the state ratifying conventions understood? What do we think they understood this subject to the jurisdiction thereof to mean? Now, one other point that I wanted to make in terms of the argument that Congress can change this by statute has to do with Section 5 of the 14th Amendment. <coughs> And in Section 5, the Congress shall have power to enforce by appropriate legislation the provisions of this article. So the argument is um, that Congress gets to define jurisdiction. Congress gets to define jurisdiction and how we know that. We know that two ways, uh, that the Congress shall have power to enforce the enforcement provision, again, in Section 5, uh, and then also the immigration, the naturalization power that Congress has. So when Congress exercised its naturalization power from the, uh, from the beginning, from the, from the founding period, even through the Civil War, it would pass laws that would give the requirements for how someone who was born elsewhere could become a citizen of the United States. Typically, it was a waiting period. It was uh, limited to free white persons. But this is how Congress exercised the naturalization powers before, uh, before the Civil War. All right, um, so the, we have the, the, Johnson and others had raised these constitutional uh, objections about the ability of Congress to, um, to legislate in this area, so we end up with um, amend, an amendment. Now, what has the Supreme Court said about this amendment? There are two cases in the next decade, so ratification in 1868, by 1898, we've had two cases in which the Supreme Court has looked at this language and has had an opportunity to uh, pronounce on what it believes subject to the jurisdiction means. Um, there is nothing before the 14th Amendment, as, we, as you saw, nothing in the Constitution defines citizenship. There was an assumption, practices, that throughout it, in the states in the United States that birth alone was enough to become a citizen if you were a free white person. All right? That was the use solely. It was really a common law uh, practice that courts recognized. Interestingly enough, when the issue is litigated, it comes up in inheritance cases. Most states would deny uh, non-citizens the right to inherit property. So it mattered if you were a citizen or not a citizen. So these are how the early cases came up. But in any event, what the Supreme Court ends up saying in these two cases is that what this language intended to do 
was to constitutionalize the use solely. This common law rule of uh, territorial birth was constitutionalized by this phrase. So that if we want to understand the phrase, uh, then we, all we need to do is understand the common law rule. And the limitations of that rule were fairly well defined at this time period, as, as it is today, in terms of um, what were the exceptions. There were really only two exceptions, two exceptions to, the, um, to automatic birthright citizenship. The first and the most important was um, uh, an exclusion of the children of diplomats. Okay, someone in the foreign service who would be in this country, in England, in any of the common law rules following the, uh, following the use solely. They were not uh, granted automatic subject status in England or citizenship status, and, and really as a, almost a matter of international law, which is uh, they are subject to another jurisdiction. Their parents are in the service of a foreign country, they're in the diplomatic corps. So the children of um, diplomats were clear, clearly understood to be excluded at the time of the ratification of the 14th Amendment. The other category, and, and this is again from the sort of ancient common law rule that had been practiced in the United States, was um, children that might, uh, children from military, uh, a foreign military, usually in the context of an invasion. But the notion again is uh, the parents are in the service of uh, an allegiance to another country. Uh, so in any event, those were two well-known exceptions. When the Supreme Court does look at these decisions, it says, yes, that's what they intended to do. Subject to the jurisdiction thereof, they meant to simply invoke this common law tradition of excluding uh, the children of diplomats and excluding children of invading armies or uh, military personnel. And in the United States, one additional thing. And that is um, children born on uh, Native American tribes. Now, subject to the jurisdiction, remember when we looked at the 1866 Act, it said Indians not taxed. Do you remember that phrase, Indians not taxed? Uh, it looks like what they tried to do with the 14th Amendment is just put all that into subject to the jurisdiction. The reasoning that Indians, Native Americans, uh, were not citizens at birth is, is again based on allegiance and sovereignty. The Supreme Court had long held that um, the Native American tribes within the United States are a separate sovereignty. They're a dependent sovereignty, but they're a separate sovereignty. So that Congress would be making treaties with various uh, Native American tribes and so forth. Um, so this was yet another exclusion. So they would say there are really three exceptions now to what does subject to the jurisdiction mean? Was this just a shorthand term? that the drafters used to try to uh, sort of pull in uh, all of these uh, disparate features. Well, that's what the Supreme Court thought. That's what it thought in 1884 in a case where it looked specifically at the question of whether uh, a child born on a Native American uh, in, a, in a tribal territory, whether a child born there was a citizen of the United States, and the answer was no. They're a citizen of that tribe. They owe their allegiance and so forth to that tribe. So the answer to that was, was no. Um, now, today, persons born on tribal reservations are U.S. citizens, but it's because of statutes. Uh, Congress in 1924 and 1940 included them in nationality acts, whether they wanted to be or not. So, uh, so the fact that a person born anywhere within the territory of the United States, including tribal reservations or citizens, is a matter of statute. So that was a, that was a case that came along in 1884. The, the second case, and this is the key to the debate, so I want to spend a bit of time on it. This is a case that's known as United States versus Wong Kim Ark. And this is a picture of Wong Kim Ark. It is um, a Supreme Court case decided in 1898. The facts of this case, Wong Kim Ark was born in California to parents who were subjects of the Emperor of China. He left with his parents in the midst of um, anti-Asian violence in, in California in this time period. He attempted to return several years later, lived in China for a while, attempted to return to the United States, but was denied entry at customs in San Francisco under uh, what were known as the Chinese Exclusion Acts. The Congress had enacted um, a series of laws 
that we call the Chinese Exclusion Act because they did two things. Uh, they stopped immigration from China, so they would turn boats that arrived and customs people would be turned away. Um, and they also prohibited naturalization of anyone of Asian descent. So, in other words, the parents, when Wang Kimok was born, it was not possible for them to even become citizens because of these, of these acts. And then when Wang Kimok tried to return, he would be excluded unless he was a United States citizen. So that's the issue that made its way to the Supreme Court. Is he a citizen? If he's a citizen, you can't keep him out. If he's not a citizen, uh, the Chinese Exclusion Acts, as they were read at the time, uh, would, uh, the United States was perfectly free to exclude entire races and nationalities at the border. So, um, so the argument is proposed, the Department of Justice takes the position in this case that the 14th Amendment does not apply to persons of Asian descent, it only applies to persons of African descent because it was intended to overturn Dred Scott. Um, now, the Supreme Court in its uh, seven to two decision has very little difficulty, the majority has very little difficulty in rejecting that argument. The language, it says, you know, is in, it includes everyone, persons, you know, it's not, it's not directed to African Americans, it includes persons. Uh, Juan Kimark can prove that he was born in the territory of the United States. It is irrelevant, the status of his parents, uh, and therefore he is a citizen. So, um, so that, those are the basic facts of the case. It is, uh, I wanted to show you some additional slides here so you can get a feeling for the, the tenor of the times, if you will, when this, when this decision comes out. It, it, it's fairly controversial because it's essentially telling Congress uh, that it cannot exclude you know, persons of Chinese descent if they're U.S. citizens. And it, it, um, it basically affirms this view of the 14th Amendment that we have held and, you know, through today. Let me show you this one. Uh, I don't know if you can all see this. The, the legend at the bottom says, E pluribus unum, except the Chinese. So this is a political cartoon from the time, and it's uh, talking about the Temple of Liberty. You've got a passport there. This was representing, in a negative fashion, the Chinese Exclusion Acts. Here's another one, um, also known as Scott's Exclusion Act. This is a, a legend at the bottom says the Chinese <laughs> question again. What's interesting about this particular um, set of images here, obviously this is Uncle Sam, the US, trying to keep the door closed and seeing, as looks like um, immigration issues that might resonate today as well, which is, you know, what, in terms of the, the will of Congress to exclude and then the reality uh, of what happens at the, at the actual borders. And then, um, I've just always been amused by this one. This is a, a depiction of the Supreme Court in 1896. If we thought that uh, people can be irreverent about our modern Supreme Court, um, it was really pretty mild. Uh, in comparison to some earlier, this is from 1896, so it would have been a couple of years before the, the uh, Wong Kim Art decision. So to talk about the decision itself again just briefly, and we're going to have plenty of time for questions and, and your comments and discussion. Um, the, it is, um, the, the Wong Kim Art Court, the majority, goes through an exhaustive review of the history looks at a lot of the sort of debates around both the Civil Rights Act and the 14th Amendment and determines, as I said earlier, that what that really meant to do was to constitutionalize the rule of use solely and that subject to the jurisdiction of meant kind of a jurisdiction along the lines of are you in the diplomatic service or answerable to uh, the military or uh, are you in fact a separate sovereignty like the dependent sovereignties of the uh, Native Americans. Now, s the assumption since 1898 has been um, continuously, at least with, with respect to practice of the uh, executive branch and others, that it is not within congressional power to alter it with respect to the children of undocumented aliens. So the proposed statute that's in your materials would exclude children who do not have at least one parent who is a U.S. citizen or a permanent legal resident. It's been, uh, the one you have, uh, it was introduced several years ago by then Representative Deal. 
it has been reintroduced and is known now as the Birthright Citizenship Act of 2011. No hearings yet on the uh, constitutionality of this issue for this bill, but as with uh, most great constitutional questions in the United States, uh, the assumption is the Supreme Court will have to decide the issue, and so we try to predict what it would do. So here are my predictions. Um, if you have a court that's very interested in originalism, in other words, understanding we are bound by what the uh, Reconstruction Congress and those states understood they were doing at the time, um, whatever the language says, we're bound by that. I think even under originalism, it requires a constitutional amendment. Okay, so with an originalist court, I think you lose on this issue. If you go to a plain meaning, in other words, uh, we're not so much concerned with what people may or may not have had in their minds at that time as we are wh what did they, what words did they end up ratifying? What do they have on paper? What is the plain meaning? Uh, my conclusion there is, again, it requires a constitutional amendment. Um, now, it may be that is there another sort of interpretive technique where you can find that Congress does have this authority. Uh, it might be this I the idea of a living constitution. Um, the, the meaning evolves over time when faced with new conditions and, and so forth, but I, I would say that is not likely with this court. So, um, so finally, what I want to do before we have time for your questions in discussion, I want to say a few words about state legislative efforts. There are pending bills in Arizona and Oklahoma they have not, that have not yet reached committee hearings, although I think Arizona was expecting committee hearings on their particular bill uh, this week. The proposals are, the bills would require hospitals and health authorities in those states to deny uh, birth certificates to children who are uh, children of undocumented aliens. In other words, it, um, it creates two classes of birth certificates, if you will. There's sort of the regular birth certificate, and for those of you who are born in the territory of the United States, you know that's how you prove you're a U.S. citizen, right? You just pull out your birth certificate. Um, so that presumably would still work for proof of citizenship, uh, assuming that the hospital has documented that your parents were citizens. The, um, the other kind of birth certificate or documentation of the birth would note that the parents were not citizens. The idea here seems to be to uh, create a test case to get to the Supreme Court to answer this question. What does subject to the jurisdiction mean? The bills themselves recite, uh, an understand, d recite this argument about um, subject to jurisdiction means that Congress can change it, et, et cetera, et cetera. So um, in any event, it's, it, the, the idea is, and, and they're quite candid, at the press conference in which a number of legislate, state legislators, including one from Georgia, uh, announced that they would be pushing for this legislation, said, again, that it was really designed for a uh, test case. The idea is to get state compacts states would agree with each other that this is how they're going to issue uh, birth certificates and that that then is um, the basis on which they would call it cons constitutional. I, I think it's quite clearly unconstitutional for uh, two reasons, at least two reasons. One is states don't have the authority since the Civil War um, and since the 14th Amendment, states clearly don't have the authority to um, determine U.S. citizenship. They don't have the authority to do that. Um, and then it also it seems to me pretty clearly an equal protection violation. But you can also understand that it seems to be, uh, from the state's perspective, if, if, they're, if they feel thwarted at the national level, just as a matter of federalism, a state's right issue, if you will, if they feel thwarted at the federal level that they can't get these statutes to a hearing, let alone passed, let alone um, are they going to be constitutional, that this is um, at least Arizona's way and Oklahoma and others to, um, to propose that. So, any event, my uh, legal advice, such as it is, would be to spend political efforts at a constitutional amendment rather than these state, these state legislation or these congressional measures that in all likelihood um, are unconstitutional and would be declared so by the Supreme Court. 
So a nation can certainly change its citizenship practices. Great Britain did so in response to um, undocumented uh, immigration. So has Australia. Other former common law countries have done that. Uh, and the fact that the old world, compared to the new world, treats this differently and follows the use sanguinis. Uh, but in the U.S., at least my um, suggestion here is that that has to be done by constitutional amendment. Now, for what it's worth, I wouldn't support such a constitutional amendment. That's just, those are my political views. I think it's a bad idea. I think you create a caste system um, where some people live all their lives in a country and are not citizens and cannot become citizens. Um, and I, uh, pregnant women are not lining up at the borders to sneak across in time to give birth. Uh, I think we will have if, you were to, if we were to change our practice in this regards, we would have fixed Dred Scott uh, only to recreate the same problem. So, but those are my political views, and, and I suspect there are more questions about the constitutional issues. Uh, so I look forward to your comments and questions for discussion. Yeah. Well, no. Um, the indentured white person, the indentured white, the closest thing that white persons experienced to slavery uh, really died away um, by the 1810s, 1820s. So it, it really wasn't even a practice that was in memory of the, of the persons who were talking about the 1866 Civil Rights Act. Now, uh, in terms of the Supreme Court looking back at it later, they're very aware of it, and they talk about it in terms of the history. But it seems to have been a presumption that even those persons, you know, a, a, a child born to someone who was here as an indentured servant, that's how they got their passage to America. As long as they were white, they were still considered a citizen. Um, they sort of elided this notion of whether they were free or not. They still weren't, if it was an indentured servitude, they, it was not considered sort of unfree in the same way that slaves were unfree for life. Yeah, thank you for that question. That's, uh, and I, it's something that's important to note is that the U.S. has actually always followed both a use solely and a use sanguinis. So um, very early on, Congress enacted statutes that provided for citizenship for children of American citizens born abroad. So that's by statute. It's not by the 14th Amendment. And that's a long-standing practice, way before the 14th Amendment came on. So, so that's an example of the use sanguinis. You have the status of your parents, regardless of where you're born. But Congress uh, made special provision for that, for children, diplomats, military bases, all sorts of other you know, reasons that you might be born uh, abroad. And if they have that power, the, if mm -hmm. Yeah, that's part, that's part of the argument, is that you have, you have the, the authority to make citizens at birth for persons born elsewhere. Why wouldn't you have it here? Well, any sovereignty would have that, but the argument is the 14th Amendment has limited Congress's power. Um, that it, that the, the 14th Amendment was um, sort of a declaration that within the territory of the U.S., these are the rules that will be followed. And we can change that, but you have to amend the Constitution. But it is, it, it's a very, um, it, it's kind of a, a confusing situation that Congress has plenary power over declaring the children of, of persons born elsewhere from, to be citizens. There's just no, there's no question about that power. And they have the power to determine who that is born elsewhere can become citizens by naturalization. There's no question about that either. And so if you're sort of thinking about it from a, um, sort of government power and authority perspective, you would say, well, then of course they would have this power as well. But there is the 14th Amendment, and that's, the, that's really the, the nub here, is that did, that did that bind Congress such that if we're going to change that practice, we have to amend the Constitution? Yeah. What was the procedure by which the change was made in other countries, England, Great Britain, and Australia, and what was the reaction of the people? Um, these were not constitutional matters, so they're essentially by their parliaments or, st or, or legislatures. Uh, now, what is the reaction of the people? I think that there was probably 
I, I don't know for certain. There hasn't been um, a big reaction to those. There hasn't been a significant political movement to change it back. And, and my guess is since these were either parliamentary or legislative um, matters that there was sufficient popular support for them to get them enacted in the first time that that it really was um, not as controversial as um, you know as, as 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 maybe some of the some of the rhetoric of the current debates here I'm, I'm really not positive about that but um, but it is a sort of a very different process to be able to change it by legislation than it is by a constitutional amendment as because we've made it so difficult it is so difficult in the United States to amend the Constitution but I don't know if that answered your question because I don't really know the the answer and maybe some of you here are more familiar with with that no because the issues never really come up and and part of it seems to be because of the uniform practice since that time of, of recognizing the citizenship simply by birth. Again, it's a, administratively, it's a pretty easy system, okay, because all you have to prove is where you were born. You can't always prove that, but in general, it's, it's much easier to prove than the status of your parents. Now, I do know that in, um, the, the, there was some objection in Great Britain to, they essentially had to move to national identity cards to solve this problem. So the, the objection that I heard to it was not so much that it was a bad idea to exclude automatic citizenship for persons who were there illegally, but that it made it so much harder for everybody else to prove their own citizenship. That it, it sort of moved further along this administrative state idea and then national identity cards uh, were one solution to that. But you can imagine sort of administratively how difficult it would be to figure out what, you know, what was the status of one's person or just being a, you know, one's parent or both parents, or so forth, as opposed to just a very simple rule of birth certificate. So the Supreme Court, no, has not not had occasion to um, on this particular clause and on this issue, and it just it simply hasn't been challenged. So maybe that's the difficulty for uh, for opponents or, or, or proponents of the statute is trying to figure out a way to get an answer from the Supreme Court in advance of doing, uh, you know, taking these kinds of steps. I'm not sure the constitutional analysis is all that different, uh, but I think there's a great hesitancy on Congress to use a very broad, or any, you know, any sort of um, scholar on this point, to, to use any kind of broad language like not subject to our jurisdiction. Because we want them to be subject to our jurisdiction, right? You want to be able to put people in jail. Uh, you want them to owe allegiance to you, you know, so that if they're, so treason trials or all sorts of reasons why persons living here, you want them to owe an allegiance to the United States. Uh, so I think probably that reason is if you go so far to say they're just not subject to our jurisdiction, that jars with how we normally use the word jurisdiction. So it's, um, it's a, again, part of what, in terms of my own sort of conclusions, and I think that when some other legal scholars have looked at this and they conclude, you know, you, you really can't make subject to the jurisdiction mean that. What they're doing is they're looking at other kinds of cases where the court has talked about similar language. Like, should we read subject to the jurisdiction thereof in the 14th Amendment the same way we read jurisdiction in other, you know, how, con how we normally use it, et cetera, et cetera, then we would think more of court jurisdiction. We would think of, you know, power over persons, and, and surely, you know, territorial presence is one of those. Although you can understand the exception then, again, for diplomatic, children of diplomats and invading armies. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, do I see, I'm sorry. An argument to support the change, a change of statute as opposed to the constitutional amendment. 
Uh, well, yes, you could. I mean, uh, but but partly what that 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 assumes that the Supreme Court was wrong originally when it said the Fourteenth Amendment doesn't cover these persons. Um, and and I do think at least from the 1866 Act, it was pretty clear that uh, whatever the whatever the uh, Reconstruction Congress thought, you know, personally about Native Americans participating in the U.S. political system, they seemed pretty clear that to the extent they retained their allegiance to the tribe and had been born there, then, um, then there wasn't actually a right to make them U.S. citizens. This was their choice. They chose to live on the reservation as opposed to living elsewhere. So Congress later is, you could argue what they're doing is kind of fixing um, they're making them citizens whether they want to be or not. So they're sort of bringing them into the American polity more as a matter of control and, and asserting more jurisdiction over the... But, but yeah, I mean, that's, clearly this is part of the argument over subject to the jurisdiction because that's not technically you know, part of what the use solely was about. So I think absolutely these kinds of arguments about congressional authority. Congress can make citizens of all sorts of people and Congress can decide not to make citizens of all sorts of people. Um, I had the impression that um, prior to the 14th Amendment, uh, leaving naturalization aside, that U.S. citizenship just followed the form of state citizenship. So yes. Uh, if a state follows you so large, so, uh, so, so would U.S. citizenship. All of that changes. I wanted to suggest one place where maybe Congress did exercise power over U.S. citizens. Um, it comes out of Justice Thomas's concurrence in the Chicago Second Amendment case. He said that the phrase uh, privileges or immunities in the 14th Amendment, as opposed to Article 4, comes out of the treaty by which the U.S. acquires territory as it moves west. Mm -hmm. And he finds that phrase, I think, in the Louisiana Purchase Treaty and many others. And he says that it was a way of guaranteeing to the people who resided in that territory already the privileges and immunities of United States citizenship. Mm -hmm. And um, this is prior to the 14th. And he says that the 14th is kind of adopting by reference that phrase in those treaties. And that might be a place where one could see, uh, you know, that would have been Congress's decision thereafter mm -hmm. to say whether you stole it, uh, applied or not. Or even Congress's decision to decide what are privileges or immunities. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and key to U.S. citizenship rather than state citizenship. Yes. Because of the meaning of, of the way it was phrased in those treaties. And yeah. Well, yeah, that's, that's true. I mean, you can look at the structure even of the 14th Amendment. You could imagine some additional arguments. Um, the structure of the 14th Amendment, of course, it goes on to say, uh, you know, that, that states can't deny due process or equal protection. So what are they worried about? They're worried about the former, you know, states of the Confederacy denying the, 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 the newly freed slaves some of these basic rights. Now, your point about the most important citizenship before the Civil War was your state citizenship is absolutely true. And yes, you would be a you know, U.S. citizen too, but it was really dependent upon whether a state claimed you or not. So the 14th Amendment has to address this problem, and it, look how it does it. It's, it declares that you are a citizen of the United States and of the state wherein you reside. Again, because some states had said, you know, former slaves are not citizens of Georgia. They're not citizens of uh, others. So, so this is really the, I mean, the first time in the 14th Amendment that you could talk about a very meaningful national citizenship. And the problem is you still have to work out its meaning over time. We go through the slaughterhouse cases and, and lots and lots of other areas uh, in addition to just, you know, this physical birth issue, but d just in terms of what are the privileges or immunities of citizens. And, and we, we actually don't have very many, as it turns out. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, part of the U.S. or the state. I'm just thinking yeah. that's for, especially for originalists, that, that could be great. 
Yeah. No, that, and that's, a, that's an interesting point. It's a, the structure is really, um, I think, uh, up for grabs in terms of the 14th Amendment. If you look, and I wish I had a slide with the whole 14th Amendment on it so you can see all of the things that it tries to accomplish in one amendment. And at least for this issue, we've come down to that. I think we have time for one more question or comment. Yeah. Well, this was a real issue for the Hamdi case. If you recall, um, Abdel Hamdi was born in Louisiana. He's, he's captured and then taken to Guantanamo, but he's captured overseas uh, in Afghanistan. He is a US citizen because he was born here. His parents were here as a, uh, I think, temporary workers. It wasn't a student visa, but it was not, not permanent resident citizens. So in that case, when that case the Supreme Court was invited, this is one of the situations where the Supreme Court was invited to give an opinion. Lots of uh, amicus curiae briefs on both sides, but there were uh, a lot of them that said, this guy's not a citizen, and then they give this rationale that, you know, that, that Congress can actually change it and, and that subject to the jurisdiction was never meant to include uh, status of illegal immigrants. The Supreme Court decided, uh, didn't, didn't address that issue period. Um, but just in terms of how does that affect it, the dual citizenship, so he was a dual citizen. Some countries don't allow citizens who are resident there to retain a dual citizenship. You also have a potential problem of statelessness if, uh, let's say, the um, United States is to change its rule, persons maybe been living here for a long time, have a child here who's not a citizen. The parents may have a citizenship status or may have had a citizenship status, but they may not have it any longer. That country may not recognize them, may not recognize their child. So you have a problem of creating statelessness. The problem of statelessness comes up when you follow different rules. If, you've got, if everyone had territorial birthright citizenship, then it's pretty clear who's what. Um, although you do have dual citizenship possibilities. If everyone follows um, sort of use sanguinis, then it can still be relatively clear, harder sometimes to trace. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's, it's a very complicated issue. I don't mean to suggest it isn't, but, but you're, you're right to point out the national security implications because of the, of the Hamdi case. There was a sense that Hamdi, as a US citizen, even if he never lived here since he was a toddler, has certain rights that the other enemy combatants did not have. And that was the issue for the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court decided the case on the assumption that he was the US citizen. Okay, I think, uh, I know you need to go and you're busy and so forth, so why don't we stop here? I, I'll be around for a while if you have other questions or comments. And uh, again, I wanna thank you very much for your time. And uh, thanks.